Welcome back to Talking Story. My name is John Minton. I am so happy you're joining me today because we're going to talk about one of my favorite authors, one that I don't think gets anywhere near the attention he should get, and I'm talking about Robert McCammon. When I was a much, much, much younger reader, uh, I remember discovering Stephen King, and I'll never forget that first paperback cover of The Shining I got and uh, how it hooked me into to horror, and I just started a lifelong obsession with me. Now, down the rack a little bit from Stephen King was Robert McCammon, and I, no one ever recommended Robert McCammon to me, but for some reason, I think just the cover sucked me in. And pretty much every Stephen King book, there would be a Robert McCammon book, and I thought it was just as good going back and forth. He was this wild-eyed Southern writer, and still to this day remains one of my, I would say, top three Southern writers. And um, I, I just grew up loving him. And then all of a sudden, I read a story that he had... Uh, found an interest in historical fiction, and he wanted to write this book about a traveling theater troupe, I believe. I have never seen this book materialize, uh, but he just kind of dropped off the map. I mean, great books like Swan Song, Mine, Boy's Life, award-winning, amazing books. And because he wanted to move from the little box people were used to looking for him in, over to something different like historical fiction, it seemed like the shelf Nazis and publishers just wouldn't let him go there, weren't interested in supporting him at all. So it was such an amazing thing for me to finally see a Robert McCammon book called Speaks the Nightbird. He finally got River City Publishing, a smaller publishing house um, in his home state of Alabama, to print a historical uh, novel by him. Now, in that novel was the birth of a character, Matthew Corbett. He did not see this as a series. He just had this story he wanted to tell. But after this book came out, and it's a chonker, guys. I, I think when it first came out, it was in uh, actually two volumes. You can get it in one volume now. But he became smitten with this character. And now this has come into a series, and it is one of my favorite series of all times. And today we're going to be reviewing Book number eight in the Matthew Corbett series, The King of Shadows. Um, so Matthew Corbett starts out in Speaks the Nightbird as uh, an apprentice to a judge who's coming to a South Carolina town to uh, conduct a witch trial. And from there, the series moves on to him uh, joining a herald agency, and they don't necessarily call them detectives yet because this all takes place early, early 1700s, late 1600s. And um, there are the, the moniker of detective isn't used yet. So he calls himself problem solvers. And from Speak the Night Bird now to King of Shadows through these eight books, you kind of get um, an amazing the thrill ride of an early American, almost James Bond type character. Uh, and he, he goes on to after becoming a problem solver with the Herald Detective Agency to trying to track down the criminal of crime, Professor Danton Idris Fell. Uh, so that gives you kind of broad strokes of what this series is. Um, so today we're going to break down and be talking very, very uh, intimately about book eight, King of Shadows. So let's get right into it. Remember, my reviews go on a five category system, a basic five star system. We're going to look at five different categories. In each category, you can get a quarter star to a full star. At the end, we add that all up, and that's what the review is. So let's start off with world building. Again, this series, this book takes place in the late 1600s, early 1700s, and it is absolutely phenomenal at world building. You will hear the crunch of the shells that they use for roadways next in a coastal in a coastal area you will smell the stench of a london slum when matthew corbett travels from <laughs> new york back to london you will hear the screams in the bedlam asylum when he takes on the case of the queen of bedlam every sense is utilized in this world building you will absolutely be sucked in to this 
absolutely real world, but in a time removed from our own. And it is so, so addictive and appealing. I absolutely will have to give world building to the Matthew Corbett series in general, and particularly this book number eight, King of Shadows as well. I'm going one full star, complete full star for world building. Number two, let's go straight to characters, guys. And there's a wide cast of characters here. Not only Matthew Corbett, who I've kind of broken down with, but uh, oh, his partner in crime at the Herald Agency, uh, the great one himself. Um, the villains are phenomenal. The love of his life, Barry, Grig Grig Barry Grigsby. He peoples this so unbelievably well, but the main person at the maelstrom of all this madness swirling around him is Matthew Corbett himself. And as you see him from a young man, that first time you meet him in that South Carolina time, uh, South Carolina, South Carolina town, uh, to all the way up to this eighth book, uh, you get to grow with him. You get to see him spread his wings as a detective and problem solver. You get to thrill at his first true love. Uh, so much happens character-wise that you are absolutely rooting for them. The villains you absolutely love to hate, they are deplorable, and yet at the flip of a coin, you will have your heart breaking and feel for them the motivation of what drives them to this life of crime. Um, again, if you can't tell I'm gushing character, you absolutely have to go full star for every Matthew Corbett book, and book number eight is no exception. Let's go into plot, guys. Now, I got to catch you up a little bit just to go into the plot on this one. Uh, Matthew Corbett has finally come face to face with the king of crime himself, Professor Fell, and to save the love of his life, Barry Grigsby, he has decided to come along with Prof Professor Fell's um, mission and... In the last book, book seven, they get the book, The Lesser Keys of Solomon, away from Cardinal Black. Now, this book is a bestiary and recipe book to call up demons from hell. And Professor Fell has captured Barry Grigsby, uh, Matthew Corbett's love. And for him to set her free, he has to have Matthew Corbett, the great problem solver, this young man, come with him since he's beyond his best days starting to wither a bit come with him to Italy to get this amazing magical mirror that was made by an Italian glassmaker and a wizard in cahoots. And uh, they're going to use that as a portal along with this book of the Lesser Keys of Solomon to bring forth a demon and do Professor Fell's bidding. Um, so maybe against this better judgment, Matthew Corbett to save and to have Barry Grigsby set free agrees to go along with Professor Fell saying, you know, I, I, I can't believe we're calling a demon anyway. What, what can this hurt? Of course, I have to save the love of my life. I will go with you to Italy and help you um, help my worst. And it would be like Sherlock Holmes helping Moriarty. I will do this with you. So that kind of leads us up to book eight here. What's going on in the King of Shadows? So book eight, I know this series is ending with book 10. And book nine in between, I know, is a book of short stories that kind of fills in some holes that is coming out in October. So I picked up book eight fully expecting like a two book possible climactic conclusion uh, with them heading to Italy. And I got a bit of a diversion. Um, it's not what I was expecting. It's not what I was wanting. I cannot say it was not a great fun ride. But I do, it It just subverted my expectations a little bit. Uh, it went on this diversion. What we got in the King of Shadows is they load up on a boat to go from Professor Fell's Island to Italy in search of this mirror. And it's not long that, while they're at sea that their boat is attacked by a pod of whales. Between the two most dangerous animals on Earth. What in hell are you? Coming behind them is this beautiful white ship, and that's not strange because it's the same kind of shipping routes that they're following them, and once their ship is damaged, they wait for this ship to come alongside, and when the ship comes alongside, who is it but Cardinal Black, who in book number seven, Matthew Corbett got the Book of Solomon from. Uh, he thought he had dispatched him, but you cannot keep a great 
villain like Cardinal Black down. So he is chasing him back to get this book away from Matthew Corbett and uh, Professor Fell. So they are all on one boat, and they have the, the disgusting Maccabeus Decay is whose boat Cardinal Black is using to catch up with them. So now they're all in one place, and uh, Cardinal Black takes the book of uh, the keys of, of Solomon, the lesser keys of Solomon, and they're going to head to Italy, but the boat is damaged. They have a little bit of a damaged rudder, so they have to find an island to possibly repair themselves, and then they get to this island, and from there is where the diversion truly happens. Uh, Mr. McCammon gives us equal parts uh, in this mixing bowl of Shakespeare's The Tempest and Homer's The Odyssey. Uh, they uh, come across a community there of shipwrecked people living that have lost all memory of who they were and where they came from and why they're on this island. And it's kind of run by this strange wizard type king that is protecting them from a monster on the beach. And it's a fun mystery to solve. Is it the mystery I was expecting? Um, no, I have to say I would have loved to kind of get to it. I was chomping at the bit, uh, but this diversion kind of took me a little bit off guard. So for that, I, I just, I would take a, a quarter star off. I cannot say that it was not a fun mystery to unravel and to figure out how this community came to be and why they've lost their memories and how in the world are our heroes, Matthew Corbett and the great one who is traveling with him, uh, gonna stave off this memory loss long enough to to achieve the mission and get back on the boat and maybe save these people that are living on this island. Uh, so uh, you, you're absolutely rooting for them and you're absolutely invested and involved, but at the same time, it's not what I was wanting or expecting. So I'm just gonna take a little bit uh, a little bit off for plot here because he subverted my desires and wishes Mr. McCammon did and he hardly ever ever does that so I'm taking a quarter off and plot I'm gonna go mm, I take a quarter off or I'm gonna take a half star off because let me go a bit further he subverted my desires of what I truly wanted which is his prerogative he's writing and at the same time the mystery he gave me was not as fulfilling as many, many of the other books in this series. So I'm gonna take another quarter star off there and give him a half star. What I will say is this is still amazing because in this book there are two flashbacks, one for Cardinal Black and one for Maccabeus Decay, our two horrible, deplorable, disgusting, vile villains, and your heart will break for these men when he does these flashbacks. Uh, so if for no other reason to read this book than to see the backstory and the flashbacks of Cardinal Black and Maccabeus Decay, um, oh, so, so good. So I'm gonna give him a half star here. One, for subverting my expectations and desires, and two, uh, yes, it's a fun mystery and I was along for the ride, but it was not as good as I would say the majority of the other books in this series. So plot, half star, sticking with it. Uh, pace. Um, pace, I would say it absolutely trips along. Um, the pace is subverted here and there going forward because you, you do have these flashbacks um, and it does tend to slow down the forward momentum. Uh, but the flashbacks, again, I think are, once you get into them, you're going along with the mystery and then it's a flashback and then it's like, oh, that's kind of slowed things down. But now once you get into these flashbacks, they are absolutely the star attraction of this book. Uh, but I will just take a quarter off just for slowing down the momentum of the mystery that you're following. So just a quarter off there on pace. Otherwise, it's like every other Matthew uh, Corbett mystery. It really does clip. You are so involved with the characters. You're in so involved with the mystery uh, to, to be unraveled. Again, not one of the top in the series, but still you're so involved. It does clip right along and you find yourself turning pages late, 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 late into the night, unable to stop so you can figure out what's going on. So pace, three quarters star. Just take one quarter off. And that only leaves us in our five category review with pros. Guys, pros. I'm gonna gush a little bit here. There's a reason why he is one of my all-time favorite Southern writers and probably all-time favorite writers in general. And that is his prose stylings. 
he, and I'm gonna call his style in the Matthew Corbett series. And here's the thing that's amazing about McCammon. He is like a great character actor. He is not a movie star. He is not, you do not know who you're going to get when you go to a Robert McCammon major motion picture because he can change his voice so amazingly from book to book to book. He can, he can change his voice from sci-fi to horror to historical fiction and never miss a beat. The Matthew Corbett series, I'm going to say the style I like to think of that he works in here is neo-Dickensian. And now I know Dickens was publishing and writing his work in early uh, 1800s. This, is, this book takes place in early 1700s. But what I mean by neo-Dickensian is it is that same addictive nature that you cannot stop turning pages. You cannot stop following this series. Um, and the same Dickens trick as far as naming characters. What is in a name? I, a, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, right? There is so much power in names. Dickens did this with Ebenezer Scrooge, or Mr. Smallwood, Mr. Smallweed. Um, right away, you never have to look back and go, in a cast of thousands, look back and go, oh, wait a minute, who was this person I forget? Because the name right away brings a flavor and a face and emotions and feelings. Just listen to the names of some of the villains in Robert McCammon's work. Professor Danton Idris Fell, Cardinal Black, Maccabeus Decay, Taranthus Slaughter. It oozes vileness. You immediately have feelings for these people just from the name. And this is a trick that Dickens used so well. There was a reason why in his career when Dickens had something new come out, people would line up when the ship hit the docks before the books could hit the shelves. People would line up to meet the, the ship. Uh, there was a reason for that. And this series is just as addictive. So that that's kind of why in my own mind, I have coined that term of Neo-Dickensian for this prose style. And again, not the only style he can work in, but wow, it just gives you such a sense of time and place and historical weight and it transports you immediately all the while without being overdone and heavy handed and slowing down the reader. You can still just zip through the pages even though it, it, it does have a stylized nature to give you a sense of time and place and to set you firmly into Matthew Corbett's world in the early 1700s. So prose, again, I'm gushing guys, I have to absolutely go a full star. Every time Mr. McCammon puts, puts pen to paper, I have to go a full star on prose. He's never missed the mark for me in this category. So if you put all this together, what do we have for book eight? The King of Shadows in the Matthew Corbett series, 4.25 stars. Now, what do I, what do I say every time, right? Four stars, one of my all-time favorites, goes on my favorite stack. There's a reason why I found these. I, I followed this series when it was with Subterranean. I have moved over to Levidian Press now that they have the rights. And I think everything but Speaks the Nightbird, Levidian has now in very affordable trade paperback versions. Look that up. What a great, great printing house. You can get beautiful volumes. Um, this one, when you pre-order, it absolutely came signed by the author. Beautiful, beautiful, top notch. Again, four and a quarter stars. All time favorite. I get collectible hardcovers if I can. I put them up on my shelf. Um, anything above four and a half moving into five, for me, that's something that will stand the test of time and be spoken about for years and years later. And I, I, I got to tell you, there have been a couple uh, in this series that I, I would have such a hard time not giving a five to. If you check this series out, I guarantee you, you will not regret it for a moment. Such a fun, fun, fun read. Um, and for those of you that have read 
book eight, The King of Shadows, I'm gonna have just a little bit of spoilery talk. If you haven't gotten into Matthew Corbett's world, or more particularly haven't read this eighth book yet, now is your chance to sign off. My name is John Minton. Again, this was Talking Story. Like, subscribe, let me know what some of your favorite series are. If you haven't started this one, please do. If you don't pick this one up and read it, that's okay. You don't have to, but do pick up and read something. I'll see you for spoilery talk on the other side. Okay, spoilery talk. The flashback for Maccabeus Decay that gut-wrenching, heartbreaking, horrible, horrible moment when the barn was chained shut and lit a fire and these noble, regal beasts, these horses that Maccabeus Decay and his father were caring for when they stumbled out of the barn. The power of the prose of Robert McCammon in this moment, this is a literary scene that will live in my mind forever. Guys, it's up there with some Ray Bradbury and Kurt Vonnegut and I mean just some scenes that I will will live indelibly. That is a scene that will. It broke my heart, put tears in my eyes to a level that I have a hard time even uh, putting words to. If you've read this book, get in touch with me. I would love to share thoughts with you and talk with you. Thanks so much again for joining Talking Story.